Hey YouTube, welcome back to our channel. My name is Elena. And I'm Bjorn. And this is Vikings React, where we take a look at some of your favorite Viking TV shows and discuss their historical accuracies. So up until now, we've been focusing pretty heavily on Vikings Season 6, as you're well aware. Um, today we're going to do something a little bit different, and we're going to get a little bit more involved in Norsemen. So instead of just watching the show as we have been doing with Vikings, we're going to do something a little bit different. Um, we're going to kind of hyper-focus more on a couple elements that we've noticed throughout the series um, and explain or discuss uh, more of the historical elements of those particular scenes. Well, it's time for the attitude. Anyone want to go first? So in episode one of Norsemen, uh, one of the first things you see is uh, the Etistup, which is where a bunch of the elderly uh, people from the village went and uh, committed suicide, essentially, by jumping off of a really high cliff. Supposedly, there were certain sites around Scandinavia, and Sweden in particular, um, named Etistupa, which denoted the locations of where this uh, ritual senicide would occur. Typically, those would happen when uh, the village was under hard times, as you saw in the show. In particular, you know, if there was a famine or if, you know, the household couldn't take care of the elderly, they would go and perform or commit it to stoop. I'm only 47. It's, I'm, I mean, it's not that old. The term et to stupa is mostly inspired by Gautrek Saga, which is a particular story um, from the region of Gotland in Sweden. Basically what happened was there was a, a popular family that the saga um, revolved around and they were so stingy with their wealth and with their money that they would rather commit genocide, they would rather um, perform the etistup than spend their money on hospitality or like caring for the family. They'd rather just kill themselves than waste their money on that. The etistup is probably the most honorable thing you can do. Honor is really important, Bill. Yes. Yeah. Galtrek Saga itself was um, copied down in the 13th, 14th century. Um, so it is technically post-Viking Age. Um, there's no examples of it that uh, exist in any earlier manuscripts. Um, beyond this one, there's no other mention of an etistup. So it's widely believed by scholars that uh, it was not a thing in the Viking Age, unfortunately. Even though there are various place names um, throughout Sweden and Scandinavia, that referred to Et Stupa, there's no direct evidence that shows it was something that was practiced during the Viking Age. You'll never see us again. Great, thank you, wonderful. Okay, bye. Oh, it's you. In the first episode, when we meet the character of Orm, he is filling in for his brother, uh, Chieftain Olaf, while the latter is out on a raiding party. And while he's sitting on his throne, as it were, he appears to be doing some sort of crafting. More specifically, it seems like he has taken on the hobby of null binding. Null binding was used widely in the Viking Age in order to make hats, mittens, and socks out of wool for the winter months. It's an earlier form of crochet and can be done using a single needle and a lot of wool thread. This type of crafting was usually done by the lady of the house. It was usually a woman's job to create clothes, whether it would be making clothing for herself, for her kids, for her husband, and null binding also fell into that craft. Then we just have to agree to disagree, which is something I've decided to start saying. And actually in the Viking Age, if a woman was to spend a lot of her time uh, to create a piece of clothing for a man and gift it to him, it meant that she loved him very much because to create the cloth, uh, to dye it, to put the outfit together and everything uh, took a lot of time and a lot of effort. So the man that she would gift it to must be worth a lot to her. Now, while Orm is now binding through this entire episode, and I think also in the second episode, we see so him too. doing the same thing. I think so too. Um, another good note here is that his wife Freya is actually out on the raid with the men. Even took part in quite a lot of the raping. <laughs> huh? Which is something that women generally did not do. Of note in here uh, is that during the Viking Age, a woman could actually divorce her husband if he acted too feminine. Such as if he showed his chest like his collar was too low, or if he just acted too feminine, in this case, 
what Orm was doing. Um, she could actually divorce him. And on the other hand, the husband could also divorce the wife if she acted too masculine. If she dressed in pants in the kirtle instead of a dress, uh, or if she acted in any way too masculine for his liking, uh, he could also divorce her. So in this case, they could both divorce each other. Hey, Israel. Luckily for them, Orm is definitely too attached and Freya is just doing her thing. <laughs> Couldn't care less. She basically asked like she doesn't have a husband, so <laughs> yeah. it's whatever. You can at least pretend to be happy to see your husband. It's just very embarrassing. It's kind of awkward. <laughs> So I thought I'd uh, challenge you to a uh, home gun. What? <laughs> In this scene, Arvid challenges uh, one of his neighbors to a home gun. Um, home gun was an honor duel. Um, most often it was uh, something that took place if you were slandered in public or somebody insulted you. Um, it was a way to kind of reclaim your honor um, and kind of save face in Viking society. Um, happened quite frequently. Um, in this case, Arvid is a renowned warrior, but he doesn't really have much to his name. So he decides to challenge a uh, very prosperous uh, farmer neighbor to Holmgang and basically take all of his belongings. Because the law of the land said, if you fought at Holmgang and beat somebody or killed somebody, then you would inherit their property, their land, their life, basically. It became yours. That's how the rules are, and it would be stupid of me not to take advantage of it. That's right, what you say there is right. In the sagas, you see this happen a lot with berserkers. Uh, they're very feared warriors, uh, very prolific, um, dangerous people, um, almost like brutes, essentially, like that classic kind of Viking. They would go around and cause problems for the locals, and if anybody stood up to them, they challenged them to a homegang, at which point they had to either back down, which was not really an option, because that would basically admit to everybody that you're a coward and useless and weak. I'm not hiding, I'm just thinking. Or you would stand up and fight in a home gong. It was held into very specific instances. So a home gong, um, you typically meet at a crossroads or some kind of area like that, uh, where you know multiple roads meet. Um, you'd section off an area with hazel rods, with rope, or with even linen in some cases, like a large swath of cloth, um, and you would fight in that confined area. Um, if you overstepped uh, the boundaries, you would lose. Um, if you drew blood, you would lose. So it wasn't always necessarily lethal. Um, it was really to the first person wounded, but it often turned lethal. There's several adaptations of Holmgang in the sagas, most famously when Egil Skallagrimsson um, challenged a berserker to Holmgang, um, basically to help these uh, lesser farmers. Um, they came to him as a plea for help and promised him a bunch of stuff if they were able to dispose of this berserker, harassing them, causing them problems. And during the home gong, um, the berserker bites into his shield as like this show of force, and Egil, without skipping a beat, just kicks the bottom of the shield up into his face and shatters his face. You can beat him. It's all in the mind. It's 99% attitude. There's some examples where uh, the home gong will actually go on for a really long period of time without anybody getting injured, um, to the point where both parties will actually take have a truce and take a break to get water, or like unbend their swords or something. <laughs> um, in this case, it was the opposite. It went by really quickly. Yeah, he yeah. did not stand a chance. Yeah, no, not even a little bit. That's it? Thank you so much for watching, guys. We hope you enjoyed it. If you did, hit the like button, subscribe if you're new here, and hit the bell so that you can be notified of our future videos. And we'll see you in the next one. Thank you for uh, staying to watch our show. Uh, we uh, very much, uh, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know. It's terrible. <laughs> you tried. <laughs> I tried.